This serpent, often met with in Java, 20 feet in length, inhabits woody and swampy grounds, but often visits the huts of the natives, committing great havoc among the poultry, when no larger animal fall in their way. Like the boa constrictor it destroys its prey by the force of muscular pressure, killing deer, goats, wild hogs, and sheep, which it gorges whole. Wild goats, and stags with large horns, have been frequently found in their bodies when taken or killed. Captain Ross, of the East India Service, while in his ship off the island of Celebes, was visited by a canoe from the shore, containing two Malays, and the mangled body of man, the bones of which were mostly broken, the arms being dreadfully crushed. Captain Ross inquired the cause of these appearances, remarking that the eyes seemed as if starting from the head. The Malays informed him, that having landed a fish along the shore, they had left the canoe in the charge of the poor fellow, whose body he saw, that they cautioned him to be on his guard, and told him that very large snakes were frequently seen on the bounds of the wood, near the seashore. A short time however, after they left him, they were alarmed by his cries, and immediately ran back to his assistance, when they found a large serpent folded round him. They then produced the head of the snake, which was very small compared to the extraordinary powers of the animal, and its capabilities of swallowing, for there is no doubt it would have gorged the body of the man whole, if his companions had not come up. It did not measure more than eight inches in its greatest diameter. The man had evidently been seized by the wrists, as it bore the impression of the snake's teeth. The most extraordinary feature in the natural history of this animal, is the size of the head and body, as compared with its capabilities of swallowing. One which was kept alive at Batavia, in a cage, measuring 18 feet in length, was 5 inches in the longitudinal diameter of the head, and 4.5 in its greatest transverse diameter. The internal width of the lower jaw, between the portions of which the prey must pass to the stomach, was rather more than an inch and a half. Its predominant colors were greenish brown, speckled with a brownish yellow. This animal could scarcely be got out of his cage, which was small, and was not disposed to avail himself of the liberty shown him to go into an open space. It was necessary to drag him out, and to irritate him repeatedly before he would move. When he did move, however, he stretched himself to his greatest length, and without making any curves with his body, glided closely and slowly along the ground so silently, that with the advantage of his body corresponding to the color of the soil, unless watched, might easily have been passed unnoticed. When these snakes are at their full length, they may be approached with safety, as they have not found the power of darting, that's when they rear themselves up on their folds, and the head is set into the vibrating motion, they have command of their greatest power, and assume the most threatening aspect. The following is an account of the mode in which the snake, mentioned above, fed. A live duck being brought to him, he felt it with his forked tongue for a moment, and seizing it by the breast, endeavored to wind his folds around its body, which being too small to suffer from their compression, he threw the weight of one of his folds upon its neck, and strangled it. When it was dead, he gradually withdrew himself, and taking it foremost into his mouth, sucked it down his throat. But a duck was only a mouthful to him, a goat being his usual meal. On board the Caesar, he swallowed two, which were given him in his cage, at the interval of a month from each other. As soon as the goat was within his reach, he raised his head above his coil's head, and having contemplated his prey for a few seconds, felt it with his tongue. The goat did not appear to be much alarmed, as he examined the snake closely, smelling him over with great deliberation. The snake having withdrew his head a short distance, made a sudden dart at the throat of the goat, which received him on its horns, and obliged him for an instant to retreat. He then made a second dart, and seizing the goat by the leg, pulled it violently down, and insinuated its folds with momentary rapidity about its body, squeezing it at the same time as all the force he could bring to bear but even in this instance the animal was too small to suffer the whole compressing effect, and he was obliged to destroy the goat much in the same manner as he had done the duck, by throwing his whole weight upon the neck. 
The goat was eight minutes dying, but he was so entirely overwhelmed by the power of the snake, that he could not even struggle. The snake did not attempt to change its position for some minutes after the goat was dead. At length it gradually slackened its folds, and then disengaged them one by one, with great caution and slowness, as if to ascertain whether the goat retained any power of motion, and having entirely disentangled itself, prepared to swallow him by placing himself opposite to his head, and feeling it with his mouth. While doing this, saliva flow abundantly over its jaws, but it made no attempt to besmear its prey. Presently it took the goat's nose into its mouth, and endeavored to draw the head after it, but this appeared to be no easy task. The dilation of its throat seemed to begin with difficulty, as at least one third of the time was consumed in gorging the goat, and getting down the head and horns. These diverged at a considerable angle, and were four inches in length. Having conquered them, he grappled with the shoulders, which he was some time in mastering, but readily overcame the remainder of the body. He was two hours and five minutes in gorging the whole animal. The horns of the goat as they passed through the throat and the body, protruded so much as to induce the spectators to imagine they would penetrate the intervening membrane of the scales, which they separated from each other.